Thanks for the kind introduction, Corinne. Pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm joined with Sandra and Michael, and my name is Mick, and we're going to um, share with you some talking points on a concept called Biochem UDM and the implementation, a little, little story around that. And then um, Sandra will, will share more about this project we call Data Lake Tahoe, which we delivered this functionality. And then finally, we'll, we'll finish up with uh, a machine learning leverage of, uh, of our work. So uh, jumping right in, a little, a little uh, agenda. I'll give you a little background history on the unified data model. And then um, Sandra will go into some strengths and weaknesses. And then we'll hear from Michael on uh, machine learning. I'm really excited to share this with you today. As you heard from Corinne, um, IDEA is a synthetic lethal precision medicine oncology company. Um, synthetic lethality happens when there's a simultaneous perturbation in two genes that results in cell death. So we're looking for um, uh, uh, a dual uh, hit here. Um, this is a model approach. And um, with advances in CRISPR-Cas9 editing, you know, you can do some screening here. So, you know, the patient population affected by um, synthetic lethal targets is significant. Um, you know, MTAP deletion affecting, you know, 15% of solid tumors and the BRCA HRD stratification also affecting uh, potentially a lot of patients. So the impact here is significant. It's a really exciting uh, frontier uh, that we're, we're on. Uh, a quick peek at the IDEA Biosciences Pipeline. Um, uh, we have uh, several collaborations with um, pharmaceutical companies. You see here Pfizer, uh, a couple of collaborations here, uh, Amgen, um, Glaxo, SmithKline. Um, uh, our, our first um, BKC uh, inhibitor in the clinic and licensed from Novartis for a UV melanoma cancer in the eye. Um, uh, I'm personally a cancer patient, so I'm, I'm, I'm this is near and dear to my heart. Um, and, and some of the medicines and some of other pipelines I've actually taken. So this is exciting to be part of a, a bigger picture where we can potentially affect uh, patients' lives in a meaningful way. Um, IDEA uh, has several pillars. We base our science on structural biology and structure-based design. Yeah, we kind of build our platform around this. But we have potentially, you say potentially, first in the world crystal structures, because we don't know of any others who have crystallized what is thought to be a large particles in the HEMA case. There may be others, no one's published in this area, but you know, it's, it, it's a race to help patients. Um, we have uh, a, a, a expert curated um, HCS deck, um, which has been actualized and, and frozen, so we can, we can screen against multiple kinds of targets. And finally, um, we, uh, as we heard from uh, Dr. Voigt, you know, um, using, using processes to effectively prioritize and effectively you know, do a, a, a faster or better design, you know, make, test, analyze uh, cycle is, is, you know, what we realize at the end of the day. What big is your HDS deck? I'm not at liberty, but it's more than 100,000. Uh, here is a, a pictorial of the vision. This might have been the first slide I made when I, I met Chris Loudon three years ago through uh, Hunter Phillips. And, and we, we were talking about this vision of, of capturing data in the lower left, lower right. You have, you have data coming in from notebooks and CROs. And, and the thought was we would we'd capture it into a source of truth, or, or maybe there'd be multiple sources of truth. And maybe we'd have the data all the time, everywhere, all the time, everywhere. And, and then we would manipulate the data um, making um, uh, uh, specialized views or, or uh, project team views and build this into um, uh, a search engine where you can ask questions of the data and you can plug in and unplug your applications like um, Quello from, from, from QSimulate or uh, Vortex from um, Dotmatix or Stardrop from Uptibrium or the list goes on, right? You can just plug in whatever whatever you want to use here. Um, the conversation kind of landed in a place, you know, I remember saying, Chris, we need an informatics starter kit. Can we like buy something and just like do this so we can go on and do our science? Um, well, you know, we took a, a, a pragmatic approach to, to, to implementing, um, similar to what we heard from, from Dr. Voigt, um, you know, we repeatedly found ourselves executing these processes, registering compounds, 
defining assays, defining protocols, capturing data, helping scientists visualize, making data-driven decisions. Um, we wanted something super simple. We didn't want to solve this whole problem. We wanted to get off the ground and start making data-driven decisions when we had nothing or not very much. So what we did was we had conversations with our collaborators, for example, at GSK and all our CROs. Um, we probably work with the Farmerons and the Wushis and um, the Aerogen Biosciences and had a discussion around, hey, you know, can we settle on a, a common format? But this format is, is one that is kind of natural to biologists, natural to chemists, it has words in it, they just recognize, it's extensible. You'll hear more about the adaptability and scalability from Sandra. Um, we believe in the FAIR principles. We want things to be findable and accessible and interoperable and reusable. So that was a key criteria for us. And then we democratized the whole process of trying to launch an information platform. Um, we democratized that by listening to all the users and asking what they wanted. It's very interesting. We collected all together and collectively as a team, they developed what we called their scorecard. And on their scorecard, essentially had their requirements and uh, we give the scorecard back to them during the evaluation process, and they would score um, each you know, piece of the platform um, according to, to, to their needs. We needed to normalize those scorecards and then somehow pull all that together. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the process we followed was, was actually democratizing um, what they wanted, having them, having, having them vote. And in order to do this evaluation, we decided we should actually provide our data in the tools. Instead of doing better demonstrations and doing a selection, we actually started the integration process in the evaluation stage. And we, we couldn't integrate with everybody. So, you know, informatics team and, and, and some advice from workflow informatics, we would, we'd eventually select fewer players and then we'd integrate with all of them. And we integrated with all the vendors in our evaluation and you'll see what we settled on. Can I just make a yeah. question, which is, as one of the vendors, as part of that, it was a, you know, I don't just want to, you know, say nice things about Nick today, but it was a great process from our side because it really uh, allowed us on the vendor side to be very focused on the needs that you had as a company. So uh, I can't minimize what how you structure that. And I can't, you know, anyway, yeah. lots of kudos to you for making that. Uh, a process that not just allowed us to serve you better, but also I think made us better in responding to your requests and your needs. So we, we understood what we needed to do and we went ahead. So. Thanks for your comment. This, um, Whitney Smith from CD Vault. Certainly, CD Vault is, is, is in this presentation as well. Formerly CD. Yeah, formerly CD Vault, now Q Simulate. Um, a little background on um, the concept. This is not new, others have, have, have presented data models before. Um, Back about 10 years ago at Roche, um, I was on a team that wanted to integrate uh, several notebooks, public and private databases, massive compound registries, and all sorts of references. And Elsevier's Reaccess product was the tool they were using to do retrosynthetic analysis. So um, in, in about nine months, we delivered this using a unified data model we called the Reaction Unified Data Model. It defined a molecule, transformation, and then citation. And we had the application do the relationships and the similarity of the searching. And uh, we uh, released this from Roche to the, to the publisher. And as you can see, also they released it to the Postoria Alliance and then they made it publicly available. And now you can download it. It's, it's much better than our initial version in 2012, which is like the biochem medium, which is going to hear about in a minute. The unified data model for reactions and biochemistry, super simple. But the Postoria Alliance and some, some really uh, sharp Developers can make it into a more robust um, model, which which is based on current technology. Yeah. So then, um, uh, in, in in launching an information platform in a startup, um, the concept of a unified data model for biochemistry uh, was discussed primarily between Chris and myself, and we expanded the team here. And what we did here was was we wanted to get away from email and spreadsheets. We wanted to somehow auto to the extent we could registration and capture of data generation and data consumption. Um, in 2019, um, NURIX uh, leveraged the unified data model applied to the vault and pipeline pilot. We learned a lot then. And in 2021, we went live at IDEA with a similar implementation uh, extending out to AWS and uh, HarmonyML. 
And um, two publications came out last year in the uh, IUPAC Journal of Purified Chemistry. Um, the first publication here, Unified Data Model for Chemical Reactions, is published with my uh, former colleagues at Roche, Bastoy Alliance, and Elsevier. And then this was um, part of a two-paper um, submission in the special edition on data standards. The second paper uh, published here with, with Chris himself and Chris Culberson, machine learning expert, um, about UDM. And there's the DOIs. You can lift those up. Or if you need a copy, I'd be happy to give you a preprint. Um, we um, adopt a central, um, uh, a molecule-centric view in our unified data model. Um, our molecules are, are recognized purely on the connection table. There's no control vocabularies, no drop-down menus. Um, in the light of time, I'm going to move a little quicker. Um, we uh, represent hundreds of assays and a handful of protocols. And we launched the platform in a way that's adaptable and scalable. And um, yeah, uh, we, we capture data um, kind of raw, unpivoted, and then we uh, build in pivot aggregation uh, in our data pipelines. So I'm gonna give control of the meeting over to uh, Sandra and she's gonna talk to you more about the Balkan EDM, scalability and adaptability. Thanks, Mick. Uh, thanks for having me here. My name's Sandra. My background is in chemistry. Um, I, I got my doctorate in 2017 and I've been working for IDEA for two years now. So here we have the Biochem UDM. It is definitely a very versatile tool for assay capture. Now, I, I, I live with this day in and day out, guys. So I can tell you that it has been incredibly helpful. Um, and mainly it's because scientists already think in the way the model is, is, is structured, right? Most scientists tend to have this fundamental understanding of hierarchy. And that is exactly what this model really utilizes um, to leverage this pivot aggregation. So you can see that um, it also takes care of, care of data, data standardization. So I don't know how many of you have here seen the many typos and the different versions that you could have of just the word concentration. Um, and then of course you have the unit choice, which in some cases maybe you've the company has decided, or maybe you go on the one you like most. What the what the biochem uh, UDM does is you can choose any word you want or any unit you want to have in the business, but it does make it so it's integrated within the data. So then, right, your units don't get lost. <laughs> you don't not find it because there was an extra, you know, period for cons instead of no period for cons, whichever. So this really helps kind of get the data organized. And then of course, now you wanna adapt and you wanna scale, right? It isn't enough that it's organized. You wanna be able to use it, have it be a really good foundation. So now we have adaptability, which, right, as we grow as scientists, we come up with new ideas to test and how do you describe it? So. The first thing is, right, we have fields in the biochem UDM that maybe aren't used for some assays, but as you create a new assay, these conditional fields can then be utilized to better describe your assay. And so obviously, as you move forward, you're gonna have these unique combinations by the fields and then their pick list, because that's the other thing, we have controlled vocabulary. Um, you can grow it, you can grow this uh, biochem just by extending the vocabulary. So you don't even have to use the conditional fields. You can just grow your pick list. And then finally, and this is said with a cautionary voice, um, you can create an additional field, right? If it's not being described, we did this actually very, very recently. Um, and, but it was discussed as a team, right? Because data grows exponentially every time you add a vocabulary word in the pick list, you are expanding it. When you add a, another entire field, now you're expanding it even more. So definitely um, expandable, scalable, and it's really versatile. And the best part of it, like I said, it, it's already organized. It's already 
you know, the data is already structured for, for importing. And so, and because the scientists really uh, kind of just fundamentally understand and they adapt and they use it, you know, we can get near real time data share from our data generators, right? And then our scientists that are data consumers, right? They're the ones looking at this data, making data-driven decisions, and it can be done in under an hour. Um, but now I will give this off to Michael, who is invaluable. <laughs> I don't know, I think everyone's replaceable. And we always wanna have redundancy. But uh, I'm Michael, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my degree's in aerospace engineering, and I specialize in um, solving the problems with machine learning. Um, so as you know, Sandra was saying, um, and, and as Mick was also saying, you know, the Biochem UDM, super expandable, adaptable, scalable, and we're trying to use it to race towards solutions, race towards answers. So part of that is getting the data in the hands of the, the users, right? So that was kind of um, in part of this organization of you know the Biochem UDM, the Data Lake Tahoe uh, idea was born, which Mick, Mick touched upon. So um, it's based kind of on the CDD vault and tissue and mosaic, and we're able to um, hook up all of the different data viz tools that our chemists want, our scientists want to see to be able to use the tools, right? Having the data is one thing, but we're humans and being able to use tools is important. And so to visualize and, and you know, manipulate it how they want to see the data to be able to make their decisions. Um, and the data lake kind of gives us this single source of truth that everyone in all of these different data viz tools are seeing the same data. Um, and it goes by really quick, uh, the data processing to get it to them and to these data viz tools. So how do we make this happen really quick? Well, we've integrated the Biochem UDM with AWS, Amazon Work Services, to um, almost trivialize the data processing. Um, it, it all happens automatically, and uh, we have this all set up to go straight into machine learning as well. Um, the standardized data capture of the biochem UDM allows us to spend so much less time cleaning the data in preparation for the machine learning to extract the features um, and build the models that it really kind of frees up our time to be able to uh, spend it on data analysis, right? So the pyramid here kind of shows your return on investment on, on how good your models are going to be based on you know, the different parts, right? So we have the data sets that you're gonna include, right? If you put garbage in, you get garbage out. So you wanna make sure that your data is good, data is clean. Um, this, this includes the data processing, the data analysis, and then you extract your features, um, and then you plug your features into your, your models. And, you know, you can hyper, you can tune your hyperparameters, optimize them, and all that stuff with the models, but that, ultimately as a percentage of gains on being more accurate doesn't produce that much. So you really want to be spending your time in data analysis, not the data processing side and in your feature engineering, that's where you get the most gains. So having the biochem UDM, using those principles that it's based on the FAIR principles as well, allows us to um, spend, it allows us to anticipate the expansion Right, of those data sets. So when new stuff is added, we don't have to go back and rewrite our programs to process the data. It just comes right through because we've already anticipated those expansions in the Biochem UDM. Um, this is the framework that we have. Um, instead of focusing on a specific model every time, we've developed a factory concept. So um, the factory concept allows, you know, we have our data generators on the left and we have our data consumers on the right. Um, so our data generators generate the data, they'll, they'll drop it and then it'll get processed through all this automation of going through the S3 buckets, through pipeline pilot uh, in the CDD vault. And then uh, we have the databases in blue um, that are, you know, customized to each data visualization tool and how they need to see it. It, and that's kind of the data lake. And it also processes through our batch models, which you can see kind of at the bottom. So all of this data gets through, gets pushed through the machine learning models, and they get all of the raw data, as well as the machine learning predictions. Um, and so 
this is important because it allows having this data processing be trivialized and having that all automated um, frees up time for our scientists to innovate, frees up time for our engineers to innovate, to work through this design, make, test, analyze process quicker, to prioritize the compounds that they want to make um, and deprioritize the ones that you don't want to, right? Um, and so when we have these assay predictions, um, pre-synthesis, you can get information to triage the ideas for that kind of compound progression, right? Um, and with the free up, freed up time for the engineers, they can, like I said previously, you can spend more time on the data analysis, on the feature engineering to improve the models, and also on designing solutions that you're getting requests from the scientists to be able to help them visualize the data. Um, and with that, I will um, turn it back over to Mick. And the other kind of question regarding this, so yeah. what type of machine learning statistical methods are you using? Um, how many endpoints you would be using the model and how the end users actually consume the prediction? Can they run predictions on their own? Yeah, so we have, um, back to our machine learning framework, we have this interactive models and we have batch models. Um, and so we use AWS uh, SageMaker to produce our endpoints and to automate and they have great feature store and, and all of that allows us to, you know, by using the fair principles, automate all of that. Um, we currently have interacted with the data visualization tools, Stardrop and Live Design, and we've integrated in with them. And we're currently working on creating our own UI for our users and scientists to be able to interact with the models. Um, like, because we're limited, right, with the data visualization tools and what they allow us to incorporate. And so we want to branch out to be able to give them additional tools. Um, whether it be model specific tools and have information about each individual model that we're putting the endpoints on um, and uh, or more information about specific compounds and how their different projects and interact with the models as well. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good, good. Okay. Um, uh, to uh, I'll wrap up here. Um, in summary, um, we described an approach to represent compounds and assays from various sources, and and um, we've published on this, and we're happy to share um, um, everything we can to encourage its adoption because we find it useful. It doesn't solve all the problems, but we do find that you can solve the problems that are important for you right now and, and, and make your data-driven decisions and not do anything that's going to prevent you from growing or building a better system later. Um, like its predecessors, the BioCommunityM was born out of necessity. When you start a, a company or start a new discovery group, collaboration between companies, you, you want to hit the ground running. This kind of approach allows you to do that without a whole lot of resources and without a whole lot of time. Um, we really embrace the FAIR principles, and you heard from Sandra, it's fairly simple to scale and adapt. Um, we base our um, molecules entirely on the sketch. And there's some strengths and weaknesses to that. Um, the strength is you're leaning on the language of the chemists. They know how to draw molecules. And if chemists can draw the molecules right, and that's their job, then let the registration work entirely off the sketch. It's limited, right? I mean, you can't say certain things about enhanced stereochemistry that's not in the V3000 format, right? Um, so, you know, there is no annotation or tags on some sort of population of enhanced stereochemistry. Um, but, you know, we find this extremely powerful, right? Because now teaching a chemist how to register is really easy, right? And those that don't will get, will, will, will you know, capture those registrations. And, and that's a quick conversation with Sandra. Yeah. Um, through co-adoption across all the CROs and GSK, um, data gets captured while we sleep and while we're here. And that's, that's great. We can capture data overnight and we can see it in the morning. Oops. Um, uh, the BioCam UDM was uh, surprisingly useful as a pre 
for sort of machine learning. We partnered with uh, Workflow Informatics to launch the platform. We partnered with Utiliware to engage AWS in machine learning. And uh, we were pleasantly surprised how easy and, and how much Utiliware liked our data model. That was great. Um, okay. And then uh, we hope like um, the Reaction UDM, the Biochem UDM will be incorporated into uh, the Soy Alliance and the Unified Data Model. Uh, we're currently thinking about proteomics, expansion into proteins and cell lines. And with that, I just want to give a, a, a special thanks to uh, Utiliware, uh, the CD Vault, and Oracle Informatics for implementation and support. We could not have done this without you. We, we did this with a, probably nine months in a, in a very tight budget. So with that, I'll just open up any questions if you have any, and if not, just enjoy the cartoon. We have two questions uh, from Abay Seal, uh, joining in virtually. He asks, do you use any feature store, in lots, quantum chemical data, oh, and chemical data you can integrate? Yeah. Can you say the question one more time? Yes. Yeah. Do you use any feature store and locks and any quantum chemical data that you can integrate? Yeah, so we use a feature store. Um, we, we take after kind of the biochem UDM's naming conventions in order to um, make it very easily findable, right? For, for it to be able to find those features again. Um, AWS SageMaker has a feature store. Um, there, it, it's relatively new. So there's some kinks to be worked out there. Um, but yeah, we do use the feature store. We have yet to incorporate a lot of the QM or any of those other calculations. Um, so uh, we're, we're just at the beginning um, of implementing the whole data factory, right? Um, we spent that time getting the factory up and running so that we can continue to add in the new features and everything. So. And then uh, there's another one. How does data interpret between? Oh no. How does data interpret? While you're getting that question, I'd like to add on to what Michael said here. You know, we're in an interesting position after some exciting discussions with, with Dr. Perlman, who you're going to hear about next from Q Simulate. Um, we think that their Quello application and their quantum mechanical fingerprint descriptors is going to plug in very nicely to this architecture. Uh, oh, yeah, the, the question was how, how do data interoperate between all the tools, all the tools like Live Design, Stardrop, Sertara? Yeah, that's a good question. So we believe in all the data all the time, everywhere. The data looks the same everywhere. It doesn't matter where you put it, where you synchronize it, where you do your ETL. It's Stardrop will work off of an AWS Aurora database. So we instantiated our Bowcom UDM in, in a schema like you saw from Dr. Ward. We have Biochemium schema, kind of like yours, right? And um, startup is mainly understands schemas and Postgres. So it started just understands our biochemium schema. Something like live design, you know, well, we we engage shorter and we plop live design into our cloud. So we can have access and control. And then we synchronize live design using what's called simple schema. They require that. So we just kind of synchronize our biochemium so it's true. The live design simple schema makes that work. And the same thing with GQ system. Uh, this I want to be a question. Uh, once we design, if I know the compound, then we integrate, go to the testing part. Um, does it give any uh, predictability how how much will be you know like good for the you know, good for the testing? Is it go or no go decisions? You know, yeah. The, yeah. Good the, question. Multi-parameter optimization. Problem when you're trying to, you know, design structures and progress the compounds. You can decide what to make. So we're at the point now where we can um, produce probably a machine learning model for anything that has high quality data that has a good prediction. We can probably push out to the users. So currently, what we're doing is we're having chemists look at our predictions. For example, look at log S, right? Solubility. I mean, that's, that's important. It's a cheap assay, what 68 bucks you can run it, and you just run it on everything. Or you can look at the machine learning prediction. The model itself has a level of confidence on the whole thing. And then we have the confidence on a molecule by molecule level. This is, this is interesting. And, and we really kind of based on this conversation I had with Professor Ray over here in Michigan, he told me what was lacking for machine learning and feedback of users. It really is confidence metric and the data coming in and the analysis of the prediction on the, on the, on the user side. 
So they use this like prediction of log S for the virtual compounds. And it basically results in them reprioritizing, changing the ones that they're actually gonna make. They should be making compounds that are predicted to be low solubility with high confidence. Was, we know that chemotype. And uh, sometimes, you know, you find your chemist making a lot of those molecules, you can quickly again say, hey, let's not make any more of these because we know they're not really soluble. That's a good example of, of how we use it um, when deciding what to make. And we use it similarly on what compounds to send in the assays. So is, is biochemical format uh, are you using it to suck data into the data mark and or export the data for the other applications to yes. consume? Yes. Or both? Yes, we are. And we think of more of a concept rather than a format. But the SD file has biochem UDM right in there. Our spreadsheets or our CSV files have biochem UDM with the connection table right in there. That's RC, you know, compliant. Are you using the CDB? Well, from the diagram, are you using the CDB block as a single source of truth or do you have your own? Um... Great question. We think of the vault as an ingress point. It's um, uh, where data generators um, submit and we capture. Um, it's the first place data may be. So for that moment, it is a source of truth, but very soon after that, we'll be synchronizing the cloud and being all the apps and it's no longer the source of truth. We consider our, our data lake the source of truth. Okay. So what data lake solution are we using? Pardon me? What data lake solution are we using? Yeah. Okay. Close Yeah. Postgres. Postgres. Yeah. The S3 buckets, uh, Aurora Postgres, okay. uh, RD kit is in there. Uh, there's a lot of not saying uh, yes to everything we heard. <laughs> And you mentioned like, we, uh, you rely on the chemical uh, entity purely on the uh, section table, right? So, but my understanding is that section table, the two reports changes when the structure drop structure different way. So, yeah, that's okay. So we look at the connection table. It's a colored graph with nodes and edges, where the nodes are atoms and the edges are bonds and they're interlabeled with you know atom types and bond orders. I see. So we look at it from a connection table perspective. And the B3000 format from MDL, um, now, now um, uh, results the stems, you know, allows the chemist to describe enhanced stereochemistry. Like this stereo center is arbitrarily assigned, or this center is relative cis or relative trans. Mm -hmm. So you're relying on the 2000 or B3000 format? We support both. Um, if there is no enhanced stereochemistry, you can use either one. If there's no enhanced stereochemistry, you can use SMILES or ChemX on SMILES. If there is enhanced stereochemistry, well, you'll lose that information if you use V2000 or SMILES. You should use V3000 or CX1. And I guess I just, just to understand correctly, so sort of the, the like secret sauce is really the way that you design the underlying data model. And so the data generation endpoints feed through piping that make it to this model through a series of interactions, and then yeah. everything from there just sort of spiders out. So yeah. you use a lot of, you know, you're, you're integrating a lot of external tools, but the model itself and the way that you structure it is sort of the, the creation of the body map. Yes, yeah, so you want to join my team? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know if the <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but um, yeah, thank you. So I guess I, I mean, what, what, uh, what was sort of the start point in which you, you kind of decided to go for designing this model or kind of what drove you to not having that accessible um, and, and needing to break it? Um, it was a need to, you know, we were reliving this over and over again. And it was like Groundhog Day. It was, it was like Roche and then I was at Nurks and I was, I was at Adair. It was the same thing. Um, is there a way we can open source is what I consider to be pre-competitive? Um, so in our publication, we actually published the perceived structural stereo component, which is the pipeline pilot way to you know, register the compound. And you can look at the script and uh, input nine. Um, we think this is pre-competitive workflow and um, we want to share with everybody and not have to do it again ourselves. 